thank you for joining us today. Um, we are very excited to have an hour or so with you um, virtually to talk about food and how food can bring us all together in manifold ways, as well as to look at it through a sustainability lens. Um, we have with us today Celia Lam. Uh, she currently is the director at Eat with Six Senses of the Six Senses uh, Hotels and Spa School. Spa School, welcome. Hi, um, hi. Celia it has a super interesting vita, uh, I found. <laughs> um, she originally graduated from the University of Alberta, Alberta in Edmonton, Canada, uh, but then soon uh, after uh, started working already in a, in, in a in sustainability in, uh, related field with Golder, a global environment engineering consulting firm, and then did something very um, usual or unusual. I think many have that experience. Like, uh, the, she took a turn in her professional career and found her love for food, uh, which led her ultimately to study again um, at, in Vancouver at the Institute of Holistic Nutrition um, and then later on uh, at the Natural Gourmet Institute um, where she graduated a chef's training program. Um, after that, she founded uh, or co-founded or ran the Salvage Supper Club in New York City um, with the mission to rescue foods and to elevate them onto a plate. Uh, one of the most daring endeavors I find you can <laughs> do to serve somebody something uh, which your mind wouldn't perceive as consumable prior and give it a new identity for basically. Um, her travels and, and journey went on uh, until she now reached us here in Thailand um, and worked with, is working currently as mentioned with Eat With Six Senses, an initiative of the Six Senses Hotels and Spa Group to foster a holistic view on the body and on the consumption itself. So she's at the forefront of um, breaking corporate patterns as well as renewing um, perceptions. So welcome very much. Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> the other half of the conversation today will be uh, Sura at Sam Promutin, the director of the Sassin Center for Entrepreneurship and Sustainability. Um, he also has uh, a man of many hats, I want to say. Uh, he is the executive director of the Bank of Venture Club, uh, the largest, largest accredited angel investment group uh, investor group in Thailand. Um, in his past life, he was a co-producer of music, film, and TV projects. So he has a, certainly a creative side to, to all the business um, he's, uh, endeavors he's doing right now. He um, himself also founded and, and ran a startup, Style Hunt, and ran uh, in Silicon Valley and went through multiple uh, funding rounds. So he has an exclusive experience as an entrepreneur from that side. And he is uh, one cherished and very experienced uh, startup mentor, coach, uh, uh, as he proved today as well, um, in, multi, in many different um, programs, uh, among others, uh, Digital Ventures Accelerator, DTech Accelerator, Seedstar, Startup Thailand, Harbor Stadium, and else. Uh, he's on the educational perspective. He is a graduate of UC Berkeley as uh, one of our own, uh, an executive MBA graduate of the Sassin School of Management. So welcome, Sam. Thank you. And with that, I would like to hand it over to you. All right. Okay, so I'm really excited to, to have this conversation with you, Celia. Um, you know, just, just to let the, uh, the, our, our audience um, in on, on kind of a little bit of the history here. Is it was really cool how we, we connected. Um, mm -hmm. to give some credit to the folks who made that happen. Uh, so Celia, if you recall, there was this sort of ecosystem sustainability slash startup ecosystem dinner that um, uh, Paul right. Ark, Nishapat Ark, and uh, Arvin Narula, uh, they hosted us at, at Indus, a really, really nice Indian restaurant. Yeah, with um, fabulous dinner. Passionate <laughs> people, right? <laughs> so that was, that was amazing. And we went around the table uh, and um, 
each person kind of gave a little bit of their their background and definitely distinctly remember you were sitting you know pretty close by the table mm -hmm. and um your story was just so really really inspiring um thank you and it's hard to encapsulate <laughs> I'm trying to put this uh, label that on was a great dinner <laughs> <laughs> right yeah yeah yes it was actually i'm hungry just thinking about it now great group of people <laughs> yeah great conversations <laughs> So, so yeah, it was. It's almost difficult or challenging to encapsulate, uh, you know, that that um, kind of the story and the background and the inspiration that we got from you. It's really hard to put that into even one title, really. So, um, I think this talk is going to be a little bit different from from the typical talk. It's um, a, a lot of the journey, not just like in your current occupation um, and and career, but but. Uh, sort of tracing along a life path too, and a lot of things that happened along the way. So, on that note, if if you don't mind, maybe we start at the sure. uh, <laughs> away. journey. I think it was uh, was it Edmonton, if I remember correctly. Edmonton, Canada. Yeah, that's uh, uh, my hometown where I grew up, and my family is all back there. Okay, that's okay. where it all started. All right, all right, and and was it? Uh, I think it was was it Alberta University. At University of Alberta, yeah. So I graduated from the School of Business. So my roots are in, in business. Um, and I, you know, it was funny because looking uh, looking back now, and that seems like such a long time ago, I, you know, typical student, you have no, you have no idea what you're going to do. You just pick something and hope it kind of sticks. And it absolutely didn't stick. <laughs> but I think that's the natural kind of progression of life. I mean, it sounds like your in your your path has really kind of taken you different places too. Yes, yes. And you, so yours, would you? I, I think you described it as unconventional, like of the overall path. Is that right? Yeah, I think I would say so. Um, I mean, I I grew up in kind of an environment where you know um, there is a tendency to put labels and and cate you know categorize things. And if you're not in this box in this time in your life doing this thing with a manager title or whatever it is that we you know perceive to be successful, um, you sort of frowned upon a bit at the time. So mm -hmm. for me, I think to have graduated from business school, had worked for almost a decade and you know, did all the things, climbed the corporate ladder, found success, and to suddenly, you know, at that almost like peak in my career, um, I took a step back and said, I'm going to do something completely different. Um, and, and sort of, in a sense, I didn't realize at the time, but I, I guess I reinvented myself because I was looking, I was seeking something at that place in my life, and that was more purpose. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, and I, one thing I really love about um, Sasson, uh, learning a little bit more about you guys and what you do and what you're about, um, I think what really drives like the heart or the engine of, of the school is, you know, you attract people who want to, to create impact in the world, you know? Um, and I think that's, uh, there's, there's so much potential when you get to that, when, when you can get to that place in your life, mm -hmm. because it's very authentic. Yes, yes. I love that you said the, the a key word there was um, purpose. And mm -hmm. this is something that um, we have been in the process of, of um, injecting into as early as possible in students' journeys here at, uh, at Sassin as well. So before we get into all the mechanics of everything, we, we have a special module that we call skills and values. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's um, uh, a key component is about purpose, and, um, uh, and sustainability, leadership values, and other skills that need to kind of be there at the very beginning of the journey before they, they embark on, on the rest of the MBA and EMBA. Yeah. So, but, but back to, to your to your case, though. So, yeah, so the unconventional um, part, I guess, you know, when I think of, I even think of the word journey, it's it's really used so much nowadays, but <laughs> for lack of a better word, um, I, 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 you know, I, you mentioned earlier that I, I worked with uh, Golder Associates, it's a engineering, global engineering environmental consulting firm. And uh, having worked, I worked with so many different types of people, engineers, chefs, uh, business people, entrepreneurs. And it's really interesting because it, what I took, part of what I took away working at the engineering firm is that, you know, oftentimes it's very methodical 
um, mm. linear way of thinking, uh, yes. kind of like a lawyer in a sense. And so I really took a lot of that with me. And so, you know, rewind 20 years back, um, had, I, had, you, had I asked my former self, my younger self, you know, would, would you ever envision that you would be living abroad, that you would, you know, help open a plant-based cooking school, that you would launch a curriculum and teach people about food sustainability, that you would serve people rescued food from farms, <laughs> you know, I would, in a dumpster, I, I would say absolutely not. <laughs> and I think that's one thing I've learned along this journey is that um, things, life is not linear. Life is not a straight line. And I think especially when you're wanting to um, seek, uh, when you're seeking opportunities, when you're looking for growth, um, it's important to be open to things because, and especially I find um, in the line of work I do now, um, when we're looking for solutions, when we're problem solving, oftentimes, especially in fields like sustainability, which is so broad mm -hmm. and there's so many people doing great things, but there's so many challenges sometimes to get people to understand or to get people to buy in um, or to solve a problem or to come to a consensus. And yeah. I think being able to, you know, be open to looking at things through life in a different lens mm -hmm. and saying, hey, you know what, this, we keep doing the same thing. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Why don't we challenge this? Why don't we try something completely different? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so this, this is one of the things that really stood out when, when we first uh, spoke with you the first couple of times. You know, you, you talked a little bit about mm -hmm. um, the, the way you, you drive change or, uh, and changes in mindset, uh, and especially in, in an organizational context. So um, would you mind maybe digging into that a little bit and, and maybe sharing some examples of how, how your experience was with that? Sure. Um, you know, I... I have to say uh, when I when I found myself at the times in my in this journey the last you know 10 15 years where I was um, changing um, my career changing really my mind my own mindset mm. um, I, I really encountered a lot of different people along the way personally through work um, and I found that there there always was this um, underlying theme where there would be common commonalities in, in people's perceptions of what they think something is. Like, this is what I think being healthy means or being well, uh, wellness is. This is what I think sustainability is. And I think that part of it is just getting people to break out, like, you know, broadening people's viewpoint on that. And a big part of that is understanding it's not coming right to the table initially and saying, <clears throat> excuse me, this is this is the initial this is the project this is the thing and i want you to like get excited and, and jump on board so we can check all the things off the list and, and achieve oftentimes we, we just you know people want to achieve things which is great i think the first thing is just understanding that everyone comes from such different backgrounds such different perspectives and and understandings and and you know culture religion all these things shape our viewpoints mm -hmm. and it it's saying, hey, let's just get to know people first. Let's yeah. build relationships. Uh -huh. And then as that trust opens up, let's, let's um, you know, let's, instead of trying to open the door entirely, let's even just getting a crack of that door open and getting a toe in. Mm -hmm. Because that toe is, that, that's the crack, um, that's cracking the door open for curiosity. Uh -huh. And I think it's more important when you, um, can you know it's like teasing in a way you're like giving people a little bit of information and sort of drawing them in compelling them to want to know more um and creating a great experience if it's food and beverage for example creating a great experience that maybe it's not the super healthiest thing you made maybe it wasn't a salad or a green juice because I, I could tell you stories about how i try to get hosts our employees in vietnam to drink green juice and it was just so far removed from what they know, they were like, this is tasteless, there's no sugar, you know, they want to put syrup in it, um, but you meet them in the middle. And so I made them a durian, you know, coconut milkshake, but there was no additives, no added sugar, it was just really beautiful, ripe mm -hmm. fruit. Um, but that's, that's building relationship, that's getting them to know you a little bit. They're seeing you in a way that's like, this person isn't trying to impose on me their viewpoint, 
but they're respecting our culture. They're respecting who we are. Uh, they seem like they kind of know us because it's a big deal. You know, Darien's a huge deal in Asia. It's quite a luxury thing. Yeah. Um, and it, what it did is it allowed that door to open just a crack for curiosity to come in. And once, once you have people at curiosity, you can go so much further. Hmm. And in what you're describing there, at, at first, I almost thought you were talking about um, the, uh, the interaction with, let's say, guests or something in your establishment. Mm -hmm. This is actually with your Start own fellow, yeah. fellow team, uh, teammates, so to speak, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a really important thing uh, that you touched on is that, you know, um, especially when you're trying to launch something, whether it's a product line, um, an initiative project, again, it actually, your end goal is to obviously sell whatever you're selling to, to your customer base, your client, but it actually starts, it always starts with your people. People, like they say, it's your greatest asset. Mm -hmm. And what I found, especially when you're talking about things like food, wellness, health, sustainability, this is more, um, it's more than a project or a program. It's actually about culture. You're trying to get people to understand like how to adopt a lifestyle change yes. and that takes time and yes. the thing is when you invest that time and when you build that curiosity and you grow it you have very loyal followings and you have people who become the best salespeople, regardless mm -hmm. of whether or not they understand the whole technical um, aspect around it right um, because it's again it's it's very authentic it comes from a real place because they they feel it yes you know, I our video right here is just, I can just see you and, and myself, but I can already imagine our, our senior advisor <laughs> somewhere on the line, Alex Mavro, and I, I'm imagining his head nodding heavily when you said um, it's not just a project. This is something that he's, he's tried to convey to us. And it's actually, I have to tell you, it's taking yeah. some time for even for us to fully, or for myself to fully mm -hmm. digest. I get it now. It totally resonates with what you're saying. It's just so mm -hmm. much that it's not something temporary and finite and one time uh, uh, culture uh, and mindset and you know these are, these are uh, kind of alternative ways to think of it but it's definitely not just a project uh, very adamant yeah and i mean if you think about it um, in the grand scheme of things how many projects are there how many initiatives or things get launched you're we we are like one tiny fish in an ocean of many fish so it, what that does by investing in people and building the culture is it actually gives you some sustain, like longer term sustainability yes. in, you know. It, it, those two, those terms right there, they're so intertwined, you know, longer Very, term sustainability. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> it's actually, it's, 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 it's like right in the fabric of, of, of even the notion of sustainability, right? By definition, yeah. it needs to be long term. Wow. Very cool. Um, just, just for the benefit of some, some folks who might not know about your, uh, if, if we fast forward for a second and we can be a little non-linear, just, you know, sure. just, <laughs> we'll jump to the, to the present for a moment and just to, to provide a little context for what, um, can you, can you share a little bit about your, your current role and what you're doing? Sure. Um, so I, I work as part of the, uh, food and beverage team for Six Senses, which uh, operates hotels, resorts, and spas around the world. Uh, we're kind of like a, a boutique luxury um, brand that is really, um, you know, really, I have to say, really embraces uh, wellness and sustainability. And it's, uh, you know, we say this, and it might come off a bit cheesy, but we say that it's part of our DNA. And it's actually true, because it's not something we pay lip service to. Like, we don't have you know, some companies might have a CSR initiative uh, and, you know, they say it, but actually it's not really part of the fabric of the culture. People don't really, you know, people don't really buy into it. No one's really talking about it. Um, we're constantly, I think, pushing the envelope of what's next, what can we do to continually improve? Mm -hmm. um, and so my role, um, I joined about actually my four-year anniversary with Six Senses was yesterday. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and uh, part of what I do um, is I, I, I help to kind of create and develop the concepts around um, how we want to do better food. And that goes beyond just healthier food that absolutely is one component. And I think the important thing, and this is one of my big learnings, I think, in my journey is that, you know, health and nutrition is not 
independent. Like our health, um, it's not separate from sustainability. There, you know, sustainability of the earth, the, the resources that we use, food waste, these, these are all things that are interconnected. And so I, I see my role as kind of a holistic one in how we kind of connect the dots between food sustainability and health. Mm -hmm. And um, how do we, what that means is how does that translate into how we operate our hotels? Um, you know, working on creating guidelines uh, around and standards around the very first and the most important thing, which is how do we um, purchase food? You know, how do we grow food? Uh, where are we buying our food? What's, uh, what is food ethics? What does that mean? Um, what are the, you know, um, things that we want to look for around like food products, like how to read a food label? This, this sounds like such a simple thing, um, but I think the average person be, uh, and maybe if you're on this call, be very surprised to know that actually it's, it's not common. Like a lot of people actually don't know how to read a food label or where to read on a product and what to look for. How do you determine quality? Um, pushing more things like uh, scratch cooking, making more things, um, you know, the way we used to, the way our grandparents used to. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and really diving, uh, you know, we, we started, and this is something I get excited about, um, a big, I'd say a big part of my, my role is creating um, education and training. So tools and resources um, for our hosts, which are our employees across the properties so that they understand the basics of what is good health, what's an immune system, how does it work? Um, and then the application of now with that knowledge and that theory, how do I actually apply that and how can we do that for ourselves? Um, as a can we also um, impart that for our guest experience? So how do we incorporate that into our menus? How do we um, you know, create educational guest experiences where maybe it's part of cooking classes or, or whatnot? Mm. Um, so it's quite, um, so sort of a, a bit of a you know, training, education, standards. Um, there's the, uh, you know, we, I do site before COVID, I would visit the properties do the training, but I would also um, help them ident identify like where, where in your operations can you improve? Where can we improve on the training and education? Where can we improve on the interactions with guests? Where can we improve on the quality of the food in the purchasing um, process or, you know, understanding better, how do we work with local suppliers, you know? Um, so it's, it's kind of a multitude of stuff. Sorry, it was a bit of a long, <laughs> long answer to your question. No, no, that's, that's, that's very helpful. And so I'm wondering towards the, the beginning of, of what you described there, you talked about um, even looking at, at a label, right? And then right. trying right. to determine um, uh, to, to understand the, 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 the food and uh, healthiness and all these other parameters. But could you, could you maybe give um, a little example of that? Sure, sure. So uh, for example, some of the key kind of the usual suspects, let's, let's say that you want to avoid are like the added sugars, um, you know, unnecessary fillers, uh, preservatives, fake colors, fake flavors, things are basically not real. Um, generally speaking, additives are things that are added to food for a reason. So maybe it's extending shelf life, maybe it's making it look shinier and prettier, uh, maybe it's masking the smell so that, you know, we think it's more fresh. Um, oftentimes we don't need a lot of these um, additives and they can be harmful, right? Um, if I give you an example of say a bag of uh, potato chips, okay. potatoes are made, I ask our hostess, what do you think potato chips are made of? Obvious answer, potatoes, <laughs> potatoes. Oil, and salt, uh, maybe a little bit of seasoning. Um, that's what three or four ingredients I listed, right? Yet, if you walk into any convenience store, you will see absolutely probably like 10 plus ingredients, often words you can't, you can't pronounce. Uh -huh. um, and the reason is because there's many reasons, but uh, one of the things they add is fillers, which is just cheaper um, ingredients to lower the cost so that you don't have to use real potatoes. You've got processed soy and, and all this other junk. So, um, you know, it's, it's actually, a, it's, it's simple, but it's actually kind of complex. And it's one of the easiest things that anyone can do, whether you're a consumer wanting to improve the food you feed your family at home, or if you are running a business, a food business, and you want to improve the quality 
because uh, you are going to have to buy some products. So it's helping people to understand how do I gauge quality? How do I know, you know, actually what is in my food? Because oftentimes people will look at the, the first thing people look at is usually calories and the fat on the nutrition facts label, which we actually teach people. And this is where we're a bit unconventional. We yeah. actually say, um, I actually tell people, I don't even look at calories. I've never counted a calorie. I, I don't even look at the fat because not all cal um, calories don't tell you quality mm. and how your body absorbs it. And, um, you know, uh, as for fat, not all fat is equal. So what actually, it comes down to at the end of the day, what, what is going to tell me, what is the best indicator for quality? And everything kind of goes back to that. Hmm. Yeah. So if, 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 uh, if we were to sort of have a, a, a heuristic for this or a simplified way of looking at it is, it sounds like you're saying, take a look at the ingredients on whatever it is and just make sure there aren't too many things. Yeah, five or less. Counts in like the first several. Yeah. Right. there's a ton of them before you reach something that you recognize and is more normal and natural then that might not be a good sign is that yeah, right absolutely <laughs> and you know nowadays it's really important because actually a lot of people um are developing food sensitivities and allergies especially children because of the you know increased exposure to toxins mm -hmm. and so if we are, if we're in anyone that's in the hospitality world if you are in food service and you're working with food and you're feeding people something and you're saying on the menu on the label it's gluten-free or it doesn't have uh, you know xyz and actually it does because you didn't do the due diligence to actually understand um you know what what's actually in that product mm. so we there's uh there's a lot of reasons why we we, we do that okay and then um Part of the picture or the impression I got is this goes all the way to also like sort of supply chain uh, and your sourcing and things like that. Is, Absolutely. is that right? Yeah, huge focus. So um, we, you know, one of the things we really um, emphasize as part of Eat With Six Senses is, you know, reducing the distance that the food travels to your plate. So that means, mm. first of all, knowing where your food comes from. Um, as much as possible when it's possible because we have properties everywhere in the world and some are on remote islands. So of course they do have to fly and import. Um, but generally speaking, uh, really knowing where your food sources are in your area, in your region, um, making relationships like visiting your farmers and actually buying direct, cutting out that middle person wow. because for a few reasons, when you have additional, the more people you have in between the farm and, and you in that dinner plate, mm -hmm. you have one higher risk of uh, now in, in today's climate um, with COVID, you've got that risk of contamination. You've also got difficulties with, uh, you know, transportation and costs because of importing and flying. Um, and also like from a nutritional standpoint, you when food that's closer to you, when you're looking at produce, it's going to be generally speaking harvested when it's uh, at its peak freshness. So that mm -hmm. tomato or that mango is going to taste so much better and juicier because they harvest it when, when they need to, instead of doing it a week early, 10 days early, because it has to make that flight and then it's injected with chemicals. Right. Um, and the final thing I would add to that is when you know, uh, when you buy direct, from your farmers, the people growing the food, who in society actually are, uh, you know, they actually live, they 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 have a very poor livelihood. They're paid so little um, because there's so many hands that are in that chain. And so that investment in food, we're by buying direct, we're actually supporting our local farmers. We're supporting the people producing, um, you know, our food. And I think that's, so that's it's sort of like a multitude of, of reasons. I see. Uh, and then not to mention uh, um, carbon footprint, right? Carbon that, footprint, absolutely. The, the, the distance is not only about the cost, but also uh, the fuel and things yeah. associated with that. Yeah, eating food local in season, like it's just, there's it's supporting local. There's so many benefits. It just, it, it doesn't even make sense to, you know, and, and I think COVID really, what COVID did was, one of the things it did was shed light on the frailty of this crazy, um, you know, um, mass production 
where it's a globalized food system and we're relying on specific things, we're relying on this transportation uh, and it crashed. You see it crashed in places like the United States where farmers were dumping, dumping perfectly good food like wow. milk because they, you know, the supply chain was, uh, was not stable. Um, and then you have all at the same time, uh, people who don't have access to food. So I think there's a lot of things, a lot of focus uh, now, which is really great on how can we improve the situation? How can we, you know, local, have more of a local uh, supply chain? And I think one thing that we, we do through Six Senses that I really love is every hotel actually has an organic garden. And some, some have uh, farms like Yao Noi in Thailand has, uh, you know, chickens, so they've got, um, they, they have eggs, uh, there's uh, goats uh, in some of the properties, Sigi Bay, uh, they have uh, camels. So it's, it's a great way to kind of connect both our employees, our hosts, and also guests to that connection, that direct connection to food and understanding like this is, you know, a big part of why we do that is is to create that awareness, right? I'm sorry, you said that this sort of direct connection through through what means again? You need... uh, just a direct connection to food. Like, I think that, and even for myself, I have to say, um, I grew up very disconnected to where my food is from. You know, mm. I lived in a country where it was cold 10 months of the year, and I mm. uh, I hated to, I hated tomatoes because they tasted sour and like paper. They were just disgusting to me, actually. Um, and it wasn't until that was, I, was where again? Yeah, like, in in Canada, uh, okay. because we were in yeah, because you're importing a lot of it. It's not local because they, it's not the season. Um, wow. But we, we live in this world where we we get access to our fingertips um, food at any any time of the year, right? From any corner of the earth. Mm -hmm. um, and so it wasn't until actually I, during my time at um, um, the Natural Gourmet Institute when I was studying uh, culinary in New York, and I volunteered for this food sustainability initiative called Salvage Supper Club, and I was essentially rescuing food. And this was through a, a good, very good friend of mine, Josh Troyhaft, who is the, uh, actually the mastermind. This was, the initiative was actually based on his master's thesis on food waste. And so he'd come to my school and said, hey, I'm looking for um, a chef, somebody who could help me go and rescue food from farmer's markets and uh, create this amazing dining experience for people using, using rescued food that otherwise would have gone to waste. And he wanted, you know, the intention was to really, um, I think, inspire people through, an ex through a unique curated experience Mm -hmm. um, not one where we were giving them stats of, you know, the, you know, everyone's seen the global food waste stats from the UN and, and they're so important. We, I've used it too, but I think sometimes, um, this is a part about relationships and connecting to people. Mm. People just need to experience it themselves. You just need to give them a great experience with great food. And then we, sp we spark dialogue. We, people would sit around this, uh, table in a retrofitted dumpster because <laughs> uh, I was part of that was part of the um, the project and and it was to really kind of get people to I think um, change uh, their perspective of the way they think about you know food that they would normally waste and it builds it built this respect and so through that I, I visited my first farm in Queens County and it was it wasn't until you know and I was at like 35 34 when I was visiting this farm and it was a yep Celia you still there and I realized at that moment I I realized uh you know, this respect for food, um, that I developed that respect for food because you realize how much went into growing it. And mm -hmm. I saw with my own eyes, you know, the inequity in the food system that you've got this great organic farm producing am amazing nutritious food, and yet they have all kinds of food waste, not their fault. And it's partly due to the system or the lack of uh, infrastructure in the system. Um, and so, that was where, that was actually the cusp when I really started to, I think um, my impressionable mind really got to understand food sustainability on like a deeper level. 
could, could you elaborate on that a little more? So just to kind of take us uh, on that that journey and, and to help us visualize. So you're saying at, at the farm that you'd visited uh, mm -hmm. for the first time, you saw uh, an unexpected amount of, of waste that they could not control, is that right? right? So yeah, so what had happened is just to give you some context, I I was, uh, Josh and I were going to a farmer's market and we were scouring and uh, you know looking for rescue, uh, vegetables that we could rescue. So those are the, at the market, they tend to be like, you know, the imperfect space, sometimes called uglies and maybe the twisted carrots or the ones with four, four arms. Um, he had a bag of sprouted potatoes. There's like the greens that were a little bit wilted and probably wouldn't make that six hour drive back. Um, so we, we went to see one of the farmers there and she said to us, you know what? I would love for you guys to visit my farm. I would love for you to come to my farm and see with your own eyes and experience hmm. what food waste looks like. Wow. And we were like, absolutely. And so uh, first farm I visited, I learned, what I learned is that there are so many different places to food waste. And this is only in the context of the farm, by the way. So mm -hmm. the first was like I mentioned, the imperfect produce. So maybe the, the tiny beets that I pulled out of the earth, they were beautiful, but they were too small compared to the other ones. Um, and so the inconsistency in size, the, you know, people that um, the, uh, companies that they would have contracts with would come and see and say, you know what, this isn't perfect, we're not gonna buy it. And they back out of those contracts. Mm -hmm. And so the farmer ends up with that surplus and they can't do anything with it. Maybe it's the edible parts of the food that uh, the consumer, you and I maybe don't know how to use. Mm -hmm. And everyone on here I'm sure can relate in some way, maybe it's the broccoli or cauliflower stalks or those leaves. Maybe it's the stems of the mushrooms. Um, it's just parts of the food that sometimes people don't know what to do with and they actually don't realize they're still nutrition. And so the farmer actually has to cut a lot more of that product off. So leeks, for example, grow, can grow taller than you and I, and that beautiful green top of the leek absolutely can be used in so many different things. Um, but because of the transport, it costs the farmer more to be because of weight, they trim it. And so a lot of that gets discarded. Um, also, you have edible weeds, things that uh, we think are maybe a, a nuisance, but actually oftentimes you can, you can eat some of those things, there's, there's good nutrition, but it comes down to time. The farmer only has so much resources and so many hands, they can't, they can't harvest everything. Mm. Um, sometimes, and one odd thing, I, I remember one story, a farmer told me uh, he had way too many onions. He had this crazy surplus. And I said, that's great. Now you can sell at the market. He said, no, do you know how many people, like how many, on average, how many onions do people buy? It's not something that you, you would want to have, uh, you would buy more of. So in that case, there's also food waste. And lastly, for farmers, when they go out, their schedules, when they go out to the markets, um, they have to leave the farm. And unless they have you know, enough help, those days are away. Maybe it's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. For those four days, if there's uh, produce that's falling to the ground like those zucchini and nobody picks it up, uh, they essentially um, might start to decompose. So there's so many uh, layers to, to food that can become wasted. And that, like I said, is just, just talking about farms. We're not even talking about retail with grocery stores and the difference between expired and uh, best before dates, which is confusing for the consumer and it means two different things. Mm. So speaking of which then, um, are there some innovations in, in how you manage that in the context of uh, you know, eat with six senses or at six senses? Yeah, uh, great question. So I, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of different uh, ways you can take it. I think um, one really easy way is when we're looking at how we cook with food, and this applies also to people at home, but uh, absolutely we, we talk about this a lot in our food, within our food and beverage teams. Um, when you, it's like respect for food means when you do have your produce, whether it's from our organic gardens or whether it's uh, purchased somewhere, you always want to look at utilizing as much as possible of that food. Hmm. Um, you can comp even, you know, we compost, but even before you go to compost, you can still get utilization out of something. There's more value that you can get. So for example, um, a pineapple, okay. we, we always have waste, right? You've got the peels. If you've got the thick uh, cores, maybe that goes to the garbage as well. Um, you can make a drink with that. 
uh, we uh, our properties, uh, tapache is what it's called. It's a fermented drink, uh, Mexican mm -hmm. drink. Um, are a lot of our properties, sorry? I'm sorry, did you say it was a Mexican drink? It's a, yeah, it's a Mexican drink. It's called tapache. Um, and it's basically, you can, you can use the, uh, the flesh as well, but in this case, it's great for when you do have the peels because you okay. can make a nice batch and it's lovely and very refreshing. Wow. Um, uh, one thing I really love is uh, EM. I'm not sure if you've heard of that, uh, effective microorganism. So it's basically, uh, you can take, uh, it's a solution that you can create using um, waste byproducts from the kitchen. So for example, you can utilize those, uh, you can save those pineapple skins and basically it's just, um, it's a water and uh, sugar solution. And you're basically mixing that with the, the produce. You basically leave it for a month and it's gonna do its thing and ferment and bubble. And you end up with this amazing um, bacteria rich uh, solution that can be used to clean, um, maybe it's the drains in the kitchen, really? uh, use it as soil um, improvement. Um, you can use it to improve also your compost. Uh, some of the some of the formulations can be used even for like, um, you know, for uh, tonifying your skin. Wow. It's, it's really incredible what nature can do. Yeah, so you can, and then you can take those discards, the spent fermented pineapple skins, and then you can compost them. So, uh, so there okay. you see how now um, you've really taken it through the full, full cycle um, before creating. Yeah. So I think it's getting people, I think, um, going back to your question, it, it's really looking holistically at something and saying, um, what, what other value can I get for this? What other part, what, what, what knowledge do I have about working with this vegetable or fruit? How can I use this more in the cooking? Um, how can I then use it for other things? Um, in, in Six Senses, we have something called Earth Lab, which is basically uh, like, think of it like an innovation hub where a lot of this sort of thing is kind of like repurposed. Mm -hmm. And it can be for, you know, not just like new recipes, but it can be for skincare, cosmetics, cleaning agents. So it's sort of like the DIY do-it-yourself um, hub. And I think that that creativity is what's so exciting because once people see the limitless possibilities of what you can do, and oftentimes you're saving money because you're not having to buy those products um, and you're also, you know exactly what's in it and there's no added chemicals to it. Mm, I see. Now, uh, um, I've noticed a theme in, or, uh, there's a theme in sustainability I've learned from, uh, particularly from, from, from Alex too, he talks about this a lot, is that uh, it's some of these things that we talk about, um, they're, they're clearly good. They're good for people, they're good for the planet, but many, many times they're also just simply good business. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Right? So, so I'm, I'm wondering if some of the things that you just talked about, have you, you know, wearing another hat in your capacity and wearing kind of the business side, have you had a, an opportunity to look at some of these through through a business lens and 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 validate and see some of that happening absolutely i mean you know there's um i love this i love that you brought this up sam because i think oftentimes i've heard um fr from various places that comments like oh sustainability it's it's going to cost more to invest in this tool or this thing or or i need more manpower i need to hire an extra person to do this and actually, at the end of the day, you know, and again, it's a holistic look, right? It's, it's not one thing. It's mm -hmm. many things that you do. Uh, there's so many tools in our sustainability toolkit, right? Mm -hmm. And at least in the context of food, um, if you are buying more local, majority of your food is locally sourced and um, you are, or you're producing stuff in-house yourself, uh, you're making things, um, you are already going to see savings from that. Mm -hmm. um, if you are, you know, if your kitchen's implementing as more, more of a whole food cooking, zero waste approach. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for example, you've got um, uh, bones from the fish or from your meats or the off cuts every day from the produce trim because a, a restaurant or a hotel goes through tons of produce. And that instead of getting thrown away or even composted is, you know, put into a stock pot and you consistently make stock every day. 
like mm. that your and you menu engineer your and your menu so that you're incorporating things that utilize those uh those recipes uh, or bases mm. that's that's just that's efficiency so yeah. there absolutely is cost uh cost efficiencies from being to, for taking a more sustainable approach mm -hmm. um so that's uh and that has absolutely come up uh in conversation or discussions uh, many times when people do ask and it's a valid question you know will this cost me more if i invest you know, if I pay for that real maple syrup that costs 10 times more than the fake Aunt Jemima's, <laughs> that is a definitive, yes it is, but it's, um, that's, the, that's a linear question and a linear answer would be yes. But because we're talking about embracing unconventional uh, thinking, then we talk about holistic. Actually, let's look at the holistic picture. Let's not just look at this one thing in isolation. Because you never cook with, for example, in one ingredient. It's always a range of ingredients, right? That make up a great meal. Yes. Very cool. And and when you embarked on this type of uh, um, mission and, and effort, did you find, I, I presume you, you ran into friction, uh, folks who <laughs> might not, um, who might be skeptical of this and, and specifically in, in in, in your organizations or management and things like that. So uh, is, is that the case? And if so, how, how did you deal with that? How did you manage that? Yeah, um, I think like I mentioned earlier, you know, worked with so many different types of people come in from different places. I, anytime you're in an international uh, organization, you've got different cultures. Um, absolutely, people are gonna have different viewpoints, and especially when you're talking about food. And it's, Especially when going back to one of my first comments I made earlier uh, about, you know, people having, generally speaking, I found a very specific perception about right. wellness and health. And so if you enter, you know, walking into that, uh, the first step is actually just getting people on the same page and saying, hey, actually, actually, that's not that's not what I'm here to do. And actually, this is what I'm here to do. And this is the value it's going to bring to you and to bring to your property or your team, et cetera. Um, so I think it's it's just part, I, I see this as part of the process of just getting to know people um, and letting them get to know you and understanding where you're coming from and them knowing you're understanding their obstacles and challenges and and you know things that they experience in their role because once you break down those barriers then you know that friction tends to dissipate um because you're kind of on the same team now you know Does that include with with you know sort of upper management senior management that, those kinds of stakeholders as well because sometimes that a dynamic can uh it can be more challenging or there's less accessibility so was there a, a twist to that the way you had to approach them um yeah i think for me and i i mean i i suppose everyone is different for me i'm quite i'm, I'm very much more people per, like i i like people in person i you know it's great that we can see each other uh, on this otherwise it'd be really weird and awkward for me on the phone um i find that you know you can put things in words in an email you can say this is the new xyz policy initiative something and mm. sort of met with well okay because people haven't had a chance yet they haven't had a chance to really feel the excitement to really to really understand what it's about and how it's going to impact them at the end of the day people want to know how is this going to improve my life or you know uh improve whatever situation they're in so what i found is that once i've had a chance to you know um meet them in person but even before that before a site visit to a property i'll always have set up a series of calls so that we get to know each other first it's kind of a bit of a warm-up uh because the worst thing is just you know doing a drive-by and dropping in and it's like you're an eagle that's landed and it's like oh my god all these things are going to change this person's going to tell me i have to do all these things um it's like again it's relationship building um and i think once you get there once i usually land it's always so much different um from you know the first 24 hours to like three days later um mm. because people have had a chance to go to orientations and actually experience it and i i think for myself i really believe in um being real like whatever it is that like i don't i don't want to sell somebody something like i always want to first of all experience it myself mm. and the second is I try 
always to relate things to people. I think it's important to meet people where they're at. So if I go in and of course you've got your template of whatever it is you're gonna present or talk about, but I always customize it and tweak it to the location. Where am I? What, what is growing around here? What's in their garden? What do our employees see? Um, what, you know, I think that's really important because then people realize, oh, this person actually is invested. They know a little bit about us. They understand our business. They understand a little bit more about our, you know, our surroundings and our, um, our location. Right. Um, but I, what I found is that instead of trying to drill down something to somebody, especially at those uh, management levels, mm -hmm. I really try to get that. It's a mix. Of course, you have to in this role direct and, and uh, provide that. Mm -hmm. But the other part is it's coupled with also, um, I think, connecting with people and trying to get them to understand how that benefits them. Mm -hmm. um, maybe to give you an example, um, you know, I, 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 and I think it's important to try different ideas. I, I tried, you know, I, I was, I was thinking after, I think it was the first year, year and a half of doing this. And I, I thought to myself, how do I get people to care? How do I get our teams really like, how do I get people to read the product label? Cause that's a very tedious thing and no one really wants to do it. And so um, very few people, I should say. And so I created this like traffic light system and it was an Excel sheet and it was, it was very tedious. You have to basically, um, the task was, all of the purchasing teams with the chefs had to go and take a photo of every single item in the dry, uh, dry store, which could be anywhere from 50 items to 400 items. Whoa. So you can imagine, and it wasn't just one picture, it's picture of the front so we know what it is, and then a picture of the ingredients list. Ah. The green light, the traffic light system is red means, and the criteria is here, red means that it, um, it answered yes to any of these like 10 things in the criteria. The 10 things are based on um, the ingredients, so like additives, were there was there like added X Y Z. The second is sustainable packaging. Did it come in plastic, single use plastic? Uh, could it have been bulk? You know, um, and the third was can we make it instead? Is there an opportunity for that? Uh, so, so it was a very tedious process, and I what, knew that going in. Sorry, sorry to pause you because yeah, it's like a bold I, thing. Can, can, can you repeat those one more time because that sounds like a really key. <laughs> So there are three, three sort of okay. major criteria, yeah. is that right? Right. So the first was uh, the quali for quality. Mm -hmm. um, what, like basically what's in it. We have a list of things that's kind of like the no-no, like no fake color, no um, mm -hmm. you know, added sugars, et cetera. The mm -hmm. second was, um, is, there, uh, is it sustainable packaging or is it single-use plastic? Mm -hmm. The third was, um, is this something that we could, uh, I think it's like, can we grow it here? Like, can we get this in our garden or are we importing it? Yeah, it's, a, look, it's locality. Mm -hmm. so, um, so you can imagine this is such a tedious task. And I think even like, all my bosses were kind of like, you're crazy. This is so much work. No one's going to want to do it. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I just totally shot myself in the foot. But I, something in my gut just said, you got to do it. You got to do it because it's it's not an the thing is here's the thing it's not a you have to do this like every four months it's a it was a baseline you mm. can't get I really believe you can't you can't improve something if you don't know where you start True. and how do we know what the quality is until we actually really know and so and I wanted I wanted the teams to do it I wanted them to turn I wanted them to turn around those products and look at them. And what happened is actually they were smart. They dele they had a lot of people delegated. So maybe the chef had a sous chef. Uh, two of them were doing it over a Friday. Maybe it was like the purchasing assistant. At the end of the day, that's fine. It actually didn't matter who was doing it. Mm -hmm. It's that process of the team sitting down together at a table, looking at the report and being like, oh my God, half the stuff that we buy or whatever the case yeah. is, 30%, 20% uh, is in the red zone. Or actually there's a lot in the yellow because yellow means we don't know what uh, NC225 means and we Googled it and what's an acidity regulator? I don't know, is that better than that? So, and that's cool, that's totally okay. Wow. So um, the point was that when everyone actually went through this process together and I had, I had people like emailing me and texting me saying, Celia, I never, 
I never looked at labels before and I had no idea what to, I was looking at the wrong part of the label and I didn't know that this meant this and some of them actually took it further than we told them to and googled all of the NC codes, NC is additives, and they would see all these studies come up that said this can cause cancer, this can cause this, uh, possible carcinogenic uh, can cause cancer. It was like just this, this um, light bulb went off for them because instead of beca- be, being something that they felt forced to you know, respond to, that this is a corporate, it's a company thing, it's part of my job. It was, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that I'm feeding my cat. Like I buy these foods. I, feed uh, these foods. I eat these foods. And yeah. suddenly that's where, that's where true value comes because it, that the thing I mentioned earlier about you know, what's in it for me, how does this improve yes. my life? we give them now a tool that they can help themselves and their family to improve their life and how they live uh-huh. life, knowing what to feed their kids. And so um, they realize, and now of course, that's also what we feed our guests. And so we really went through this massive, you know, and this is, this is um, it's not perfect, but this is for me, that was a huge hurdle because getting people that curious and then to care caring is the next part (laughs) um that for me that was one of the things and you know i think in in all of our our careers and lives we get to these kind of pinnacles i think where we kind of question maybe maybe we've been doing something for a long time and we're like am i actually being impactful am i making a difference am i doing enough um are are people ever going to change are they ever going to become more uh more curious and for me that was one of the defining moments because i really didn't think that I would have people emailing me personally with Mm. those heartfelt messages. Wow. That's when you start to see, I think, a shift, but you have to keep, you really have to keep feeling diligent. Wow. Wow. Congratulations on it. That is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. But I can tell you there was, uh, (laughs) I was not a popular person. (laughs) (laughs) Celia in the traffic light report. (laughs) Really interesting key elements there, right? Um, one of them that I, 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 I'm perceiving is that a, there's an element of like discovery, right? It's not that, that they, they were forced, forced or forced fed something. You, yeah. you help cons- kind of construct a, a scenario in which they could discover for themselves. And then, and then it's again, this, there's an, a dimension or, or a part that relates to them you know, personally. You seem like really, really key things. It, it makes sense even more now. If I think back to the beginning of our conversation, it's a, very much the same theme. I love that word you used. Yeah, I love that you used the word discovery. That's a very, it's because it's very tactile. It's very like engaging. And I think that's what needs to happen in many of these cases. People need to get their hands, you know, in dirt, uh, growing things. They need to be, you know, make cook in the kitchen, cooking things. They need to actually read the food they're buying and and some people do i mean to to their detriment i think people were they just didn't realize how bad it was because again they didn't no one really looked at the whole the holistic view it's not that bad it's never that bad it's just a little bit just a little msg just a little sugar just a little (laughs) bit you know um it's really interesting yeah (laughs) <laughs> similar to the what happens with our whole world in aggregate as well <laughs> you know <laughs> okay just so um uh what coming back to to your life journey um you know because we see very clearly i think it comes through the passion of uh with which you just you know shared some of those things with us so we, we see where where you you are now um but if, if i remember correctly you you weren't always at this point either. There's some things that sparked your your own transformation and your your own um, development in this direction. Um, can you share a little bit about that and how how that happened? Uh, sure. I think I I'm not sure if you mean if you're referring to like the health the health change. I think so. Um, yeah. So uh, you know that where where life took kind of a very un I, I guess unexpected twist I should say is um you know at that mark at that cusp where I was in Canada and I was, you know, at the top of that corporate ladder, I had got the job, the dream job I wanted and everything was great on paper, but I just felt like something was sort of missing. Um, I think that soulful purpose that was, that was missing. And one day I was getting ready for a, um, a meeting with my boss uh, on the East coast. And I'll never forget this. I woke up one day and I started to see these little like blacks, kind of like rain um 
falling from the sky. Uh, and I thought, I thought it was just dust in my eye and went away. And then the next day came back and I went to the doctor and long story short, it turned out I had developed a case of retinal detachment. And it was so an eye, I had, I basically had like an eye injury and it was quite serious. Um, it was one of the most severe cases and I was quite young at the time. So um, I went to the hospital, I had multiple complications. I was actually off work for like two months. It was quite an ordeal. Um, and I actually, uh, a series of complications kind of blocked the vision in actually this right eye. Um, and it wasn't until only I think um, last, maybe two years ago, I was able to have procedure. So for se almost seven years, I basically didn't really see out of this eye. Wow. So I was learning to adapt to life again, which was really hard. Um, and it was during this time that I really did a lot of soul searching. And I said, you know, what is it that I'm so scared of that I can't, you know, follow my heart and do the things I really want to do, which was at the time, go back to school. And instead of, at one point it was to do MBA school, but then I, because of the situation, I think I was so compelled to learn about food and I wanted to understand the mechanics of you know how does how does food and nutrition um work how does how does your body factor in like what how how does how can food be used to heal us um while at the same time you know clearly cause cause illness and, and injuries so I went on a bit of a you know I guess a soul journey to one understand that and that was what precipitated going to holistic nutrition school in Vancouver Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was actually looking back, it was a larger, um, it was a larger calling. I think I wanted to, um, metaphorically see, learn how to see the world in a different lens mm -hmm. with different eyes. And I wanted to kind of challenge the status quo for myself at the time, which was, you know, um, the belief system that I had grown up with that was imparted on me. And a lot of that was filled with fear. So, um, I, I went to a nutrition school, uh, and then I moved to New York to study culinary because I felt that there was a really important, um, piece there to understand food more. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, it was at that moment that I had to let go of, you know, the corporate career and the perceived safety net of having the job. Mm -hmm. And then I just sort of let my gut, um, guide me wherever I, I went. So I guess that this this stage, the unconventional part for me is that the old Celia, the very linear work with engineer Celia would have said, absolutely not. You have to know exactly what you're going to do. Like you need job security and, you know, insurance, all of those things. Um, instead, all of the, all of the opportunities that came my way after that point, when I made that pivot in my life um, and went back to school were so organic. I, I never, you know, really ever plan to move to Thailand to, you know, open a plant-based cooking school and teach there. Wow. I never plan to work for a hospitality brand and, you know, travel around the globe teaching people about food sustainability. Uh -huh. um, so that, I guess that was the very unconventional part was um, just sort of having trust um, that if you, you know, believe in something, whatever you believe in, believe in it wholeheartedly, you know, stay true to your integrity. Um, and that whatever it is you're seeking, that purpose driven path, follow it because it will be, it will naturally lead you to the place yeah. that you want or need to be. I yes. feel it's, I think that also it's that authenticity that uh, you just can't fake that. And I think it brings, it brings good energy, the right energy to you. Just like I feel that's how we, we met through Paul and Nisha and, you know, very, very cool. Well, I, I've never tried this. Can you high five on this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we've, uh, it's time has flown by really, really quickly. Uh, so um, I think we were out of time. Yep, Raphael has popped up. <laughs> um, sorry, I didn't mean to uh, jump right there. No, 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 go ahead. Yeah, I thought, um, thank you very much. Like it has been a blast to listen. And um, it's, I think, really, really insightful. Uh, and I think we, we talked a lot of before uh, when getting to know each other and what we want to do today. Mm -hmm. I think you, you really um, like 
uh, some some people on Facebook already commented uh, like fruitful tips and uh, sharing caring is sharing like it's uh, you you had some awesome two gold nuggets in there so much appreciated thank you very much um, thank you so much for having me no, thank you thank you Celia yeah um, I think everybody is, is still um, processing. I would say mm. um, we don't have any questions earlier. Alex mentioned that uh, Sam, you were spot on with your comments. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alex. <laughs> so, um, unless somebody from the audience would like to ask something, I'm gonna check the chat. And I just wanted to uh, give a little shout out because I know some of my friends, colleagues joined in or registered and going to watch recording later because it was an ungodly hour of like 4.30 a.m. So it was so great to have you guys on the call or watching later. <laughs> yeah, and uh, please feel free everyone to uh, like, share and subscribe to the video to our uh, Facebook uh, page of the SEC, we will bring you other content uh, of like this one uh, to you, and um, we certainly will make sure that you get the, the full video uh, at your disposal after. All right, thank you again, Celia. Really appreciate it. Uh, super, and super inspiring, and then you know even more. I mean, we, we really got to that was a cool, cool <laughs> journey. Fun. That word again, even in a in lot the of fun. <laughs> All right, take good care and um, yeah, hope to see you again sometime. Sounds great. Okay, and thank you to our audience. Thank you so much, whether you're seeing this now or later on, really appreciate it. I um, hope this, uh, this is a great opportunity to, to connect um, through our community. If you have questions or uh, yeah, even, even for questions for Celia, you're welcome to reach out through us as well. Um, so we hope to see you again. Thank you very, very much. Have a great evening. Um, stay safe, stay well. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Sam. Bye, Raphael. <laughs> Bye.